<laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Murray. Um, Okay, so um, our last final session for tonight is tree protection on the ground. Um, and what we're going to look at is first, um, just a backgrounder. I'm going to do a backgrounder of what the Islands Trust is up to uh, right now on, on the tree uh, bylaws. And second, um, I'm going to look at Machosen, BC as an example of a tree bylaw and specifically the cost and time impacts. And then we're going to have a discussion and we have some guests here. We've got Ben LaFleur. Hi, Ben. Ooh, ooh. Oh, he's probably muted. Um, and he has on his team um, at, in his uh, company, Good as Wood Tree Care, he has a certified ar arborist and certified contractor, tree contractor. We've also got Jamie Harris. Hi, Jamie. He's there too, he's, he's on mute too. Um, Jamie is a certified tree faller and he's from Salt Spring Island. Okay, so this one's a bit loaded this slide, but on this side, what we've got is the dates and the types of council meetings, Islands Trust Council meetings or executive committee meetings um, through 2019 uh, uh, to up till pretty much now. So on the other side, uh, it shows you that the type of presentation on specifically related to tree bylaws, et cetera, um, mostly um, delegations and specifically by Raincoast um, Conservancy Foundation. Um, and then the other ones are staff briefings. I would note that in September, just this past September, um, that council, trust, the trustees really look deeply at um, tr a tree bylaw and they had breakout sessions. So this is ongoing. So now up here, it's September 2020. This is just one slide from Rain Coast's delegation. And then look here where it says number three, <clears throat> pursue an imp the implementation of tree cutting permits. Um, and you know what I realized after Megan's um, presentation, they are also pursuing to have authority over forest management uh, over the PMFLs, which um, was, uh, was quite amazing to me. But so this is slide is just showing you one example. On the next slide, what we've got is all of the five recommendations that Rain Coast put forward. And that came out of um, a well-funded um, study um, um, by Rain Coast to Environmental Law Center at UVic. Um, and then again, we just look at the one that the little one that I'm looking at today, which is um, pursue the implementation of tree cutting permits. Okay, so um, I've just got a couple of little things that came out of this. And one is um, what this statement says basically is, um, you know, if you, I, I think some of our people here tonight um, made delegations at, um, at council, at the council meeting. And resulting from that, um, the, count, uh, the trustees may say, well, study, study these things further. So what, what the trustees did, in fact, was basically cut and paste those ideas and say, please study them further. That's what this first one says. And then the second one says that the Islands Trust Council request from the province, the ability, I'm going to paraphrase here, the ability to uh, get tree the jurisdiction and authority equal to that of municipalities and that would come through section eight of the community charter we're going to come back to this particular thing so this again is a cut and paste from the staff briefing of december 2020 and again you can see it's a cut and paste of the recommendations and the one that we're looking at i just i guess i just want to stop for a minute here and say that in my years of uh, at, in municipal environment, working environment, I can't say, I know, I know it's done differently here with, with delegations and that sort of thing, but I can't say that I ever saw where council would use an advocacy group as a sole source. I, almost, I know it's not a sole source because there's staff with expertise, um, but, but you just wouldn't see this sort of thing um, in, in, uh, that I recall in Surrey or Vancouver where I worked. Um, because first of all, it, it, well, where I worked, the, like engineering department had all the expertise and there wasn't that much that 
other people could tell them. And then if they didn't know something, any of us in planning or other departments, if we didn't have the expertise in house, we would go to an engineer or a professional consultant and we would pay for a report to give that advice. So I just wanted to make note that there's something a little bit um, off going on here um, that maybe we should be looking at further. Okay, so some people were asking about how do we achieve the authority for a tree cutting, oops, sorry, uh, for a tree cutting bylaw. So quickly, it starts from the Queen um, and then uh, in the federal government, and then it's downloaded, to our authority to have regulations and stuff is downloaded to provincial authority, and then that is delegated to a minister. I believe it's delegated to the particular minister and therefore the ministry. In our case, that is the Ministry of um, Municipal Affairs and Josie Osborne. So you can see here that a tick means that this particular act or charter that is under the, that particular ministry has the authority to enact a tree bylaw. And I worked with the Municipal Act and the Vancouver Charter, yes, and then the Community Charter is the one that the Islands Trust would refer to to achieve the authority to um, have a tree bylaw. So I just added that in to make it a little bit clear. So then for example, if you look at the Rain Coast take action page on the Coastal Douglas Fir Forest, there's a reason why they said write to the premier if you want a tree bylaw and if you want to enact you know, all this expansive authority over top of all our forests, um, it's because the authority comes at the provincial level. At this point, however, the request has been made to um, expand that into the Islands Trust. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the second part, which is cost and time impacts. We're gonna look at Machosan, BC. There's Victoria, Souk, so Ch Machosan is in between. It's an incorporated mun municipality. So of course it gets a tree bylaw just by being a municipality. Um, and they have had one. The population is quite small at 4,700. And the interesting thing is it has a really rural context. So it's one of, maybe one of the few places that actually has a rural context like the Islands Trust. Um, and so let's just look at an example site, um, a treed site. Um, and in Machosan, they have listed protected trees. So um, this is the list here. And you can see, you know, just an example of how those trees would might be distributed through the site. Okay. so. I think a big question that people have about tree bylaws is, well, I have to be able to build my house. Um, and so when you get, this is what Machosan has done, and it's probably fairly typical. You cannot restrict the, what, what the use of the land is for. So you have to be able to build your house if it's zoned for a house. So you would get a building permit for your house, for your outbuilding, for your services, your septic, a whole bunch of things. In that area that you see, that's the house, that's the um, area around it of some amount, you can not only remove all trees, but you can remove protected trees. And it's the same for a driveway. You get a separate permit for a driveway and in that area, you would be able to remove all trees and protected trees. So then what are we looking at? We're not looking at a building permit or a driveway permit. We're looking now at a tree permit. Now, so that we're in over and above the needs to fulfill the use of the land and have a house, um, you might have sort of what might be called discretionary tree removal. It's probably not the right word, but gives you the right idea. So in that area, let's say you want a bigger yard, you want more sun, you want a garden. Um, for all those reasons, you would have to get a tree permit. And in those areas, you cannot remove those protected trees. So then just a quick summary, we've already talked about the reason for removal. It's somewhat discretionary, but you do need a permit for all of that beyond your house. Um, protected trees cannot be removed. The permit fee in Machosan is $40 for under 50 trees. Now for someone like me on a small lot in Magic Lake, um, my permit fee would be $40, which would be pretty inexpensive. The larger you get, it gets much more expensive. Um, therefore, in Machosan, it's fairly easy and fairly fast by all accounts, because I spoke to some contractors. And oftentimes, the owners will pull the permit, or your tree service contractor can do that. 
Now, this one here is a tree surveyor arborist report. And so this is where the money really comes in. Um, and so you're looking at at least, uh, you know, a thousand to three thousand dollars to get the trees that you want to remove surveyed and a report. And in addition, you would be in Machosen. Their building inspectors do the inspection for the tree permit. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk to like at $40 for me to have tree removal, you can imagine that that would not cover all the costs because there's permit staff in the office. And I mean, you've got to have a city hall in an office. It's part of the infrastructure. You're paying for every little tiny bit of that. Also, you have to pay for the inspections. Um, um, and I don't think there was an extra cost for inspections or that they paid. For, I, I'm not 100% sure about that, but they were probably included. So you can tell that um, it's probably more, uh, much more than $40. And so really in those costs, you have to look at where the cost recovery comes from. And it would generally come through general revenues and that just basically means taxes. So, you know, it just seemed to me that that was a pretty heavy uh, expense and complex bylaw for a place like, you know, with such a small population. And I thought, you know, I bet you they, they've got high income. <laughs> Um, and so, yes, sure enough, um, income is eighty-seven thousand. This is on the this is on the website, um, and um, uh, British Columbia is eighty-one thousand. And then here's the Southern Gulf Islands, and uh, I was actually quite surprised by this. Um, this is very low, um, and um, I, so I looked at it. It's fifty-four thousand. The um, lowest rural BC income is forty-three thousand. And I, again, I would say as a person that works in, a, you know, in policy, um, this would be a dominant factor or indicator that you would take into consideration on any policy you were making. So, um, you know, it's a little bit uh, uh, worrisome um, uh, that, uh, you know, to, to, to see that this, this um, kind of comprehensive and expansive and complicated bylaw um, adding expense to everyone. Um, would um, would all, you know be put on to um, people who are already struggling? So now I've got a bit of a gory slide, um, um, and this is the um, Trincomalee site. Um, this is um, from Rain Coast was very uh, close and involved in watching this whole thing, and there's many good photographs. Um, so I have a question: um, Would a tree bylaw stop? very much removal from this site because this is, I understand that this was, um, uh, they, these people tried to get a share a driveway through but the neighbors couldn't get it and threw up their hands and said, okay, fine, we'll do the whole thing. So there's a long driveway. And of course you wanna put your home down low, close to the water. Um, so it's a long driveway. There's a lot of cut and fill in here. So many of the, you couldn't save trees in that area to put that driveway in. So is it possible that a tree bylaw would, um, not even stop this, which is a, something that people are very worried about. Okay, so that's the end of my part. I'm going to hand right over to Ben Lafleur, who I know is there but muted. There he is. Um, so why don't you go ahead and talk about your uh, comments on this? Yeah, hi to my Tinakoto, Tinakoto Katoi, uh, Iwi Salish, and uh, Southern Gulf Island. My tongue to yours. Good to be aboard. And I guess um, unofficially and um, self-appointed, I'm kind of representing a pack of highly skilled and talented and um, certified uh, Southern Gulf Island arborist crews that are out there busy uh, working uh, for clients all over the Southern Gulf Island. And um, I think, <clears throat> I think uh, yeah, naturally there's a lot of concerns when the words tree cutting permits uh, have been thrown around in conversation and I, th I think the main consensus from our group is we we're hungry for information and we're hu hungry for accurate information uh, so we can learn how to better service our clients in the southern gulf uh, moving forward if something like this is to proceed our concerns are probably not quite as deep cutting as jamie's he'll go into that i'm sure pretty shortly but uh, all the same uh, it will mean we'll have to adapt pretty quickly um, to service everybody properly. Um, 
yeah, I, I, I don't really have anything to add in the sense of here is our knowledge of the situation. Uh, I know there's many on board here tonight that are uh, <coughs> that are listening in, Galliano, um, Saturna and Pender, and of course us here on Main, um, that are very eager to get some of this information uh, so we can start making some good decisions moving forward. Um, it was, I just want to make a note, David, it was nice to see uh, on your biodiversity map uh, a little New Zealand down there below uh, Australia. <laughs> I also noted it was 100% uh, red hot, my friend. Yeah. So uh, somebody was looking at your maps, buddy. Um, yeah. Um, so that's really where we're at. If, if any of our uh, group and we've um, a silver lining to this, we've been able to establish a, a Southern Gulf Islands Arborist uh, group on Facebook and it's uh, been nice interacting with the other contractors too and and we are starting to push around questions amongst ourselves and I know there's concerns around costs, uh, 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 additional physical uh, requirements that may be put on us because of something like this and when we're already pretty pretty busy and how it may uh, impede uh, the, the kind of progress we need as um, we're making properties safer and cleaner um, because a lot of trees uh, are fading in these uh, Gulf Islands too. So, um, I and uh, thank you uh, for having me aboard and uh, I appreciate the wealth of knowledge coming out of some very uh, knowledgeable uh, heads here tonight. Thank you. Um, that's great, Ben. And, um, you know, oftentimes these, this is what you see in public processes is people get together in foreign groups and great things happen. So that's really good news. Um, Jamie, um, well, I'm going to hand over to you now um, if you can talk about your experience. Sure. Um, hi. Thanks um, for having me. <laughs> um, I'm a certified BC tree faller and um, this initiative that uh, the Islands Trust is pushing had me quite concerned. And last November, I started a petition that was strongly worded <clears throat> and um, it was uh, to terminate the CDF project. And I had 700 and something signatures, um, you know, in a couple of months and the, the petition is now closed. Um, so anyhow, um, what I do is provide a service for, um, private property owners and it ranges from you know we clear for agriculture um, site preparation for a new house or maybe private property owners <clears throat> just want to harvest some of their trees in order to make some money uh, the logs we produce often go to sawmills right here on the island or to local sawmills in nanaimo and a plywood uh, mill up there also those logs go to a log home builder up in parksville um, we also clear blowdowns, which we worked for almost two years, cleaning up strictly blowdown from that big storm we had a few years ago. Um, and we, you know, we'll do a lot of culling of the dead cedar trees that are around or dying, <clears throat> um, thinning for fire smart sort of practices. Anyways, this, um, the CDF and the policy statement that's kind of been put forth by the trust this year um, is very alarming to myself and to, um, you know, a large network of folks who provide all kinds of essential services for people here. Um, this would really decimate my livelihood and, um, and my ability to put a roof over my head and feed my family. And there's others in the, in the same boat. <clears throat> um, we've been a part of these, the people that provide these services have been a part of the islands here for generations. And, um, we really need to to take an op, you know every opportunity to protect our right to live and work here as a part of the nature of this place. Um, I started a petition, or I did the petition, but with that I had a, a website with a link to that petition. <clears throat> that website's been updated. It's called StopTheIslandsTrust.com, and you can go there, and there's a bunch of links to the, all the different. Um, Islands Trust uh, trustees, 
as well as the Minister of Municipal Affairs and um, and Ministry of Forests. So if you could go there and, you know, or pass that info on to other people to go there and to let them know what's happening and, and uh, voice your disdain for the Islands Trust and what their the agenda they're pushing. Um, you know, really there's, the agenda they're pushing is that there's a problem here where there really isn't one when it comes to forestry. We're doing such a good job that we're basically being overgrown. <clears throat> we're not keeping up with the growth between the two major they're not even major, the two small logging outfits that are here, we cut maybe 20,000 cubic meters per year on a stellar year. <clears throat> and the growth here is 350,000 cubic meters conservatively um, from, um, from a, um, RP, RPFs that we've talked to. <clears throat> We'd like to get the trust to hire registered professional foresters to do this analysis of the growth here on Salt Spring. And I'm sure, or we're pretty sure that it will come in much higher than 350,000 cubic meters of growth annually per year. And this growth compounds as well. So 20,000 cubic meters of the cut versus 350,000 cubic meters of growth. It's more than 100% sustainable what we're doing here. And um, yeah, that's about all I really have to say, other than thank you, David, the information you have is, uh, is, is really brought this false narrative to light that the, I, the IT is pushing. And um, yeah, thanks. Um, Jamie, I don't know if you wanted to mention the OCP. I've just put the slide up. Oh um, yeah, good point. Yeah, um, for years, you know, we've had a copy of the old OCP and there's a part in there that protects forestry workers. And, you know, we used to talk about that here and there and, uh, and we felt we had a bit of job security and it seems that they've just taken that right out of the OCP without, you know, nobody that I know has any knowledge of it happening or was told that it was gonna happen, you know, they weren't told that it was gonna happen. So I've talked to Laura Patrick recently and tried to get some answers about that and um, haven't heard exactly you know, the, the definitive, a definitive answer on it yet, but hopefully we'll get one soon. Um, we'll okay. To get our, uh, to get it maybe reversed or something here. We don't yeah. need more regulation, we need less, really. Yeah. But. Okay, I'm going to unshare the screen so that uh, Marith can put up the time lapse. Um, but uh, I think, uh, oops, it hasn't done that. Stop share. Um, and um, so, Jamie, it was a funny story that, um, you know, when we started talking about this, you said, oh, you know, because I'm a policy nerd, um, you said, oh, can you look up the policy? Because I know it's there. It's section B2, B110. And, and sure enough, in the back, I said, no, it's not there anymore. And not only that, forestry isn't even mentioned anymore. And yeah, so, and no. So <laughs> you had an actual piece of paper from the back of uh, a, a truck, you know, the work truck kind of all crumpled up yeah, and there it was. the OCP's been kicking around in the truck for however many years and, and you know i know that there was an amendment in 2008 but um you guys you guys have no awareness of it so i i don't know what that means but you know hopefully you'll hear back from laura on that i hope so yeah i really hope so um and hopefully it's not a pinocchio rated answer so <laughs> okay okay so murray that looks like you're ready for sure. Yeah, so guys, this is a Google Earth Engine, which is an incredible resource, and it's a time lapse of a portion of Vancouver Island and the Southern Gulf Islands. And I think it shows you that the rate of change in the islands is not what might you might expect. So I'll run the time lapse. We have a lot of these types of videos created and put into our YouTube channel. So if you have a favorite island, you can go there and uh, look carefully. So the time lapse runs from about uh, 1984 to, to 2020. And the data sets are aerial photos, Landsat, satellites, images, etc. So um, it's a very comprehensive and rigorous data set. And um, I'll just play it and we can look at it together. Okay. Oh. 
So it starts in 19, up in the right corner, it starts in 1983. Now we're at 1993, moving forward. I love to look at my own island, Will. But... um, So there we are at uh, 2020. And I think you can see that even though there were a lot of changes along the way, relatively speaking, the Gulf Islands are not deforested. So um, I'll just run through it one more time. It's fairly quick. And now maybe you can see top right, you can see, um, I didn't really introduce it very well, but in the top right, you can see uh, the years as they run by. So I'll just run it through again quickly. And as I said, all of these videos are in the YouTube channel, so you can take a look. Okay, and, and while we're doing that, I just we're just going to kind of summarize, um, and and we have one last slide that asks a asks a question. So, me, how about this? If David's study suggests uh, that this coastal Douglas fir is definitely not tiny, um, it uh, and and then further study on his uh, species at risk, and um, and we find out that that isn't true. Um, and that the forest that we love and love to live in is okay as it is, so long as we follow wildfire preservation practices, then, you know, it, you have to ask yourself is, if that's the case, okay. Then on Galliano, there's a big development permit area over the whole island um, where you really can't do much to it. And that, that's really creating a lot of fuel um, with, um, uh, as, as was mentioned, um, and putting that island probably more at risk than um, other islands like Salt Spring, if you can see in those time lapse, it, um, it, it's, it's uh, probably Salt Spring with less contiguous forest is much better on a fire risk perspective. David, I don't know if you're cringing with my conclusions here, but then lastly, that question of if a tree bylaw won't stop a snaking driveway down a steep site where you want your house down close to the water, which there's a few sites like that in the Gulf Islands. What is all this about? So I'm going to um, share screen for our last slide, um, which is a, a bit of a um, uh, uh, contentious, uh, I'm hoping I can get this to go, but it is the um, uh, Bettis Road property. Um, and Mary Beth, you need to go to slideshow mode, maybe. Yeah. I know, but I, oh, sure. okay. I don't know why it's not responding. But anyway, let's just let's just look at this. Um, so this is the, um, these are snapshots from, th this caused tremendous concern from so many people. Um, and you can see um, 2018, 2020. Is it possible that there's very few, very, very few of these. And that in our age of fire risk, uh, there, there may not be as bad as you might think. And, um, you know, do we need to take on this massive effort on the coastal Douglas fir zone ecosystem and this intensive idea that we don't remove any trees? Okay. So, um, we can also just talk about, um, uh, Marie, we were going to end this and just say, you know, what, what would next steps be? Let's all think about it and what can I do to get involved in this?